and I'm 76 years old, and I say that only because that will put you in mind of where and under what conditions I learned to read, which is the Dick and Jane thrillers uh, of the 1950s with pipe-smoking father, and uh, he always showed up at the dinner table in a two-piece suit and tie, uh, and uh, mother who had the below the knee green dress with a white frilly apron with no spots on it after preparing and slaving over a hot stove for her family, in, which she enjoyed. Uh, they never gave the name, the last name of that family in the books. I, I'll bet if you looked at the mailbox outside, it might have said the Stepfords. <laughs> now, it, it, they, were, they were boring, but um, they did have a dog, Spot. And since I never was allowed to have a dog and wanted one desperately, my heart did race a little bit when they would come up with such wild exclamations as, see Spot, run, <laughs> run Spot, run, 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 run. These books, they really always lacked conflict and excitement of any kind. Now, that suited the old bat teachers that I had. Uh, I'll say more about that in a bit. Uh, they, they liked books like that, and I just can't help but think about how some of those people, and I had the, my first nice teacher, as I will tell you, I, was the fifth grade. I had to go that far to get somebody who cared and was nice, you know. Uh, the teachers didn't like boys. They didn't want boys in their classrooms, etc. But I would like to think how they would roll over in their graves if they saw some of the picture books that we have over here for children today, it's, it's evolved, you know, and I think it's good. Uh, for instance, uh, someone farted. <laughs> you know? uh, and that's because almost everybody farts. <laughs> you know? and, uh, but here's my favorite. This isn't about farting. This is, this is really cute. Bootsy Barker Bites. This is realism, stark realism. As a child, there were children who were dangerous and in this one, the mother says to the daughter, like, oh, guess what? Bootsy's mother's coming over, and she's bringing Bootsy. You two can go out back and play behind the barn, you know, and she bites. You know, she's just an evil kind of person. I was on the playground once uh, as a kindergarten, or no, yeah, kindergarten, and I didn't know the rules of the playground, and um, these boys were starting to laugh at me, and I, I was little, and I didn't know why, and suddenly, I was wrapped up in arms and lifted and squeezed. And there was this big, gigantic boy who had been there for a couple of years. He was in special ed or whatever. And he drooled and all over people. And he liked to pick them up. And, and after that, I would always be down. It was like playing poker. You know, I would have my back to the wall, you know, so I could see if anybody was coming in with a gun. But uh, they, they pulled him off me. Uh, so anyway. Uh, a point I, and by the way, the original plan two days ago was five hours long. <laughs> so I've added a couple of hours. So, all right, no, I actually cut it down to under an hour, but I'll blab, so who knows. Uh, it's kind of funny because when I started reading, reading was like virtual reality. And by that, I mean that when our teacher read E.B. White's uh, Stuart Little, I became that little mouse. I sat in and drove that little toy car. I piloted the little toy sailboat across the pond. It was me. And so it was kind of like virtual reality. And I might make a couple of references to other computer equivalencies that we had back then. But honestly, I got more encouragement from my brother, Dennis, uh, and he still lives here, you, probably, you might know him, than any teacher until fifth grade. Uh, he was a few years ahead of me, and he liked to share what he was reading in high school. I was probably in s seventh grade or whatever. And uh, he would bring his books home. And like, for instance, one time they were reading George Orwell's 1984, and he lent me his copy, which I wasn't interested in at first. And I got a chuckle out of the first line, which said, it was a bright, cold day in April, and the clocks were striking 13. I thought that was ridiculous because I knew clocks didn't strike 13, you know, but, but uh, that was how I learned about the 24-hour clock, you know, 1,300 hours is 1 o'clock. Uh, 
and my reading level began to climb because of Dennis. Too much, sometimes. I don't know how old I was when he handed me Edward Albee's play, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? But I was much too young for that. And you may not know that story at all. Uh, it's still R-rated, you know, in, in the movies. Uh, and it was a story of a crazy, screwed up couple whose marriage had turned into World War II. And they were hurling epithets at each other that I could never even imagine, you know, et cetera. And so I was shocked, fascinated, intrigued, uh, but yet I was getting a vocabulary lesson as well. So I can tell you, and I really, this is true, um, one word I picked up from, you know, Virginia Woolf was a line that was done by the Richard Burton character in the movie. And it's this line right here. I will fight you, one hand on my scrotum to be sure, but with my free hand, I will battle you to the death. Scrotum? I assumed it was a battle shield of some kind. So I consulted it in the dictionary and was shocked. Shocked that the dictionary even had such a word. So it was kind of like the dictionary at that point was becoming my 1950s version of the dark web. And it got worse, you know, as I went on. I, it was a friend of mine who shall rename Anonymous who once handed me his old man's copy of the most seriously banned book of the 20th century, which was uh, Grace Metalius's Peyton Place. It was, you know, back then they didn't have X-rated movies or anything like that. They just had movies and adults only. And so that was one of those. But the book, it was like opening Pandora's box to a disturbing and intriguing set of knowledge, you know, like, dare I say, carnal knowledge or whatever. But anyway, that paperback got passed around so often that if you dropped it, it would automatically flop open to the worst part ever. <laughs> you couldn't even close it up. So. But that's enough about me and my reading adventures. Let's jump into some literature. Okay. I picked To Kill a Mockingbird first because I assume that's something that most of us know pretty well. Maybe not everybody, but hopefully. And uh, just to say that the book is narrated by Scout Finch, daughter of Atticus Finch, attorney at law, in a very, very rural community called Macomb, Alabama. And this little section here is uh, details Scout Finch's, and that Scout's a girl, as you might remember, her first day of school ever. And it's also the first day of school ever for young Miss Caroline, a school teacher. And it's a, it's a little scene about learning to read. I hope you don't mind being read to because I do that a lot. I just can't stop sometimes. I read to that poor woman right there sometimes, don't I? But, you know, sh sh shut up, just leave me alone. All right. So you can imagine that I'm in first grade and I'm a girl. Got that? And this is narrated by her. Miss Caroline began the day by reading us a story about cats. The cats had long conversations with one another. They wore cunning little clothes and lived in a warm house beneath the kitchen stove. By the time Mrs. Cat called the drugstore for an order of chocolate malted mice, the class was wriggling like a bucket full of Catawba worms. Miss Caroline seemed unaware that the ragged, denim-shirted, and flower-sack-skirted first grade, most of whom had chopped cotton and fed hogs from the time they were able to walk, were immune to imaginative literature. Miss Caroline came to the end of the story and said, Oh my, wasn't that nice? And then she went to the blackboard and printed the alphabet in enormous square capitals, turned to the class, and asked, Now, does anybody know what these are? Everybody did. Most of them had flunked first grade last year. <laughs> I suppose she chose me because she knew my name. As I read the alphabet, a faint line appeared between her eyebrows, and after making me read most of our textbook, My First Reader, and the stock market quotations from the Mobile Register aloud, she discovered that I was literate, literate and looked at me with more than faint distaste. Miss Caroline told me to tell my father not to teach me anymore. It would interfere with my reading. <laughs> teach me? 
I said in surprise. He hasn't taught me anything. Miss Carroll, Atticus ain't got no time to teach me anything, I added, as, as Miss Caroline just smiled and shook her head. Why, he's so tired at night, he just sits in the living room and reads. Well, if he didn't teach you, who did? You weren't born reading the Mobile Register. Well, my brother Jim says I was. He read in a book. Now, let's not let our imaginations run away with us, dear, she said. Miss Caroline apparently thought I was lying. Now, you tell your father not to teach you anymore. It's best to begin reading with a fresh mind. You tell him I'll take over from here and try to undo the damage. Ma'am, your father does not know how to teach. You can have a seat now, Miss Jean Louise. I mumbled that I was sorry and retired meditating upon my crime. I never deliberately learned to read, but somehow I knew I had annoyed Miss Caroline, so I let well enough alone and stared out the window until recess, when my brother Jim told me, Oh, that's just the new way they're teaching the first grade this year, stubborn. It's called the Dewey Decimal System. <laughs> now, Miss Caroline's Dewey Decimal System consisted in part of Miss Caroline waving cards at us on which were printed the cat, rat, man, and you. And since no comment seemed to be expected of us, the class received these impressionistic revelations in silence. I was bored, so I began writing a letter to our cousin Bill. Miss Caroline caught me writing and told me again to tell my father to stop teaching me. Besides, she said, we don't write in first grade. We print. You won't learn to write until you're in the third grade. Okay, now, speaking of the teachers I had in school, I swear that the luck of the draw waited until fifth grade to give me Miss O'Brien, who saved my life, I think. She was younger. She was ugly as a mud fence, as they used to say. Uh, and she used to be a Catholic nun. And something had happened, I don't know what, maybe they found out that she loved life or something, I don't know, back in those days. So I, I guess she, you know, lost her calling there. But fifth grade was where she belonged, and it was obvious that she loved children, uh, and that she even loved me, you know. And for the first time, I got all A's and all year long. Uh, it was really nice. Uh, she made a big difference in my attitude, and uh, it was wonderful. I, I wrote that little poem, and I know you've got a copy. I'll just read it. Magic Copper Drive. And by the way, it's 1956. If yours says 65, my apologies. <laughs> Uh, that just wouldn't work out. Uh, all right. Back in the 50s, Miss O'Brien encouraged us vulnerable and impressionable fifth graders to turn on, tune in, and drop out. <laughs> often. And to that end, regularly seduced us with heavy little doses of Reed magazine. And she had slipped us the secret open sesame for opening all those Alibaba cave book covers, behind each of which lay alluring warns of white rabbit holes, ripe for the spelunking. Each one, seductive and magical, luring you onward toward the velvet underground of the Tab Book Club, where for maybe seven or eight quarters, wheedled from parents or pilfered from piggy banks, you might just score two, possibly three, mind-altering titles. And then home you'd abscond, racing up the front steps to your little castle turret bedroom, your crib, the newly acquired stash already blistering your fingerprints off with anticipation, heart racing, pupils dilating on the cover art, inhaling that new book scent, and then finally allowing yourself to, yes, tune on, <laughs> turn on, tune in, and drop out of your boringville, no fun on school nights life for a while, and to heck with the homework for now. A trip of a thousand words begins with a single sentence. Huck Finn was my imaginary friend, Becky Thatcher, my first crush, and Miss O'Brien. Miss O'Brien was a real dealer Pied Piper of Hamlet. Now that tab book club was wonderful, and it's still in my memories. I, if some of you may have old enough, you might have had that. Uh, it was wonderful because, first of all, the flyers would come, sort of like the uh, Shaw's flyers, only they would have beautiful pictures of books all over. What? Were you telling me something? Phyllis? 
No. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were saying something to me. No, no, oh, okay. I'm just tempting. My apologies. Okay. So anyway, we'd get these flyers like every two months. Looked like you were saying something to me. Uh, and Here they were. Mind. Yeah, that's true. Uh, to, to me, they were more exciting than the Sears Roebuck Christmas toy catalog. I mean, because it was a different season. Uh, it would drive me crazy. And uh, a little single description under each one. And for the rest of the afternoon, you'd be so distracted going over and over those choices and wondering, how many can I get? How many will Dad let me have? And then off home, and the negotiations would begin around the supper table, punctuated by lots of please, 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 please. And then finally, negotiations completed, tearing out that little uh, paper form at the, on the last page of the flyers, filling out the order form, and bringing it to school with your payment. And Miss O'Brien would put that in her great big ledger. And then it was the, the excruciating wait. Have they come yet? Have they come yet? Uh, eventually, when I'd forget all about it, they'd come. And on the table in the back would appear these two cardboard, corrugated cardboard boxes. And we would want to get in them. We would go up and try to touch them, you know, like the man apes in Space Odyssey 2001, you know, they were like that. Uh, and we weren't allowed to, and I was like drooling like Pavlovian dog. And it would take about a week, but eventually the time would come and you could take your book home. And I remember, honestly, the first two books I ever took home, one was uh, Codes and Ciphers, which I knew would turn me into the best decoding code breaker in the country, and it did. <laughs> and the other one was Old Yeller, which uh, I read in a single sitting on the stairs, on the upstairs stairs, and then cried myself to sleep because I didn't have a dog of my own and uh, I wanted one, just one that wouldn't get rabies and have to be put down at the end. But anyway, here's, there's another poem that I found that a real poet did um, called Bookmobile. And, you know, when a community can't afford a library, often uh, a little library on wheels will take over the task. And this is by a girl named Joyce Sutpin, and it's in her voice. I spent part of my childhood waiting for the Stearns County Bookmobile. When it comes to town, it makes a U-turn in front of the grade school and glides into its place under the elms. It's a natural wonder of late afternoon. I try to imagine Dante, William Faulkner, and Emily Dickinson traveling down a double lane highway together, country western on the radio. Even when it arrives, I have to wait. The librarian is busy getting out the inky pad and the lined cards. I pace back and forth in the line, hungry for the fresh bread of the page, because I need something that will tell me what I am. I want to catch a book, clear as a one-way ticket, to Paris, to London, to anywhere. Because that line, because I need something that will tell me what I am, that was me. I needed anything that would tell me what I might possibly turn out to be and to tell me all the things my parents weren't in any hurry whatsoever to clue me in about. Youth was an escape room to me. My lust for reading was a passionate quest to figure out how to get out. Not only through books, but also through movies and the lyrics of popular songs. They were all doors offering me a peek out there into the jungle of my possible futures. Songs like Louis Louis were written in codes I was working on to decipher. <laughs> I longed to know anything and everything about growing up, about smoking, about being macho, uh, about girls, about marriage, about sin, about living and dying. Anyway, that was me. Let's go back to Makem for a, a little second shot and then we're going to move on. This is uh, Scout in the afternoon. She's gone home, complained about her morning at school that first day. And now she says, I returned to school in the afternoon. I took my seat when a sudden shriek shattered the silence. And I looked up to see Miss Caroline standing there in the middle of the room, sheer horror flooding her face. It's alive, she said. The male population of the class rushed to her uh, as one in her assistance. 
Lord, I thought she's probably scared of a mouse. Little Chuck Little, whose patience with all living things was phenomenal, said, which way did he go? Uh, Miss Caroline, tell us where he went. Quick, D.C. He turned to a boy behind him. D.C., shut the door. We'll catch him. Quick, ma'am, where'd he go? Miss Caroline only pointed a shaking finger, not at the floor, nor at her desk, but to a hulking individual unknown to me. Little Chuck Little's face con contracted, and he said gently, you, you mean him, ma'am? Yes, um, he, he's alive. Could he scare you in some way? Miss Caroline said desperately, I was just walking by when it crawled out of his hair. It just crawled out of his hair. Little Chuck grinned broadly. <laughs> there ain't no need to fear cootie, man. Ain't you never seen one? Now, don't you be afraid. You just go on back to your desk and teach us some more. <laughs> Little Chuck was another member of the population who didn't know where his next meal was coming from. But he was a born gentleman. Now, don't you fret, ma'am, he said. There ain't no need to fear no cootie. I'll just fetch you some cool water. The cootie's host showed not the faintest interest in the furor he had wrought. He searched the scalp above his forehead, located his guest, and pinched it between his thumb and forefinger. Miss Caroline watched the process in horrid fascination. Little Chuck brought water in a paper cup, and she drank it gratefully. And finally, she found her voice. What is your name, son? She asked softly. The boy blinked. Who, me? Miss Caroline nodded. Burris Ewell. Miss Caroline inspected her roll book. I have a Yule here, but I don't have a first name. Would you spell your first name for me? <laughs> don't know how. They call me Burris to home. Well, Burris, I think we'd better excuse you for the rest of the afternoon. Now, you go home and you wash your hair with lye soap, and when you've done that, treat your scalp with some kerosene. What for, Mrs.? <laughs> to get rid of the cooties. You see, Burris, the other children might catch them, and you wouldn't want that, would you? The boy stood up. He was the filthiest human I had ever seen. His neck was dark gray, the backs of his hands were rusty, and his fingernails were black deep into the quick. He peered at Miss Caroline from a fist-sized clean space on his face. No one had noticed him, probably, because Miss Caroline and I had entertained the class most of the morning. And Burris, Miss Caroline said, please bathe yourself before coming back tomorrow. The boy, the boy laughed rudely. You ain't sending me home, missus. I was on the verge of leaving. I'd done my time for this year. Uh, he's one of the Yules, ma'am, uh, one student said. Whole school's full of them. They come first day every year and then leave. The truant lady gets him here because she threatens him with the sheriff, but she's give up trying to hold him. She reckons she's carried out the law just by getting their names on the roll and running them in here first day. You're supposed to mark him absent the rest of the year. But what about their parents, Miss Caroline asked in genuine concern. Ain't got no mother, was the answer, and their pa's right contentious. Burris seemed flattered by the recital. I've been coming to the first day of the first grade for three years now. <coughs> Reckon if I'm smart this year, they'll promote me to second. Miss Caroline said, sit back down, please, Burris. And the moment she said it, I knew she had made a serious mistake. The boy's condescension flashed to anger. You try and make me miss. Little Chuck Little got to his feet. Let him go, ma'am, he said. He's a mean one, a hard down mean one. He's liable to start something, and there's little folks here. When Burris Ewell uh, turned on him, little Chuck's right hand went to his pocket. Watch your step, Burris, he said. I'd soon kill you as look at you. Now go home. And Burris seemed to be afraid of a child half his height. And Miss Caroline took advantage of the indecision. Burris, go home. If you don't, I'll call the principal, she said. Report and be damned to ye. Ain't no snot, no slut, or no school teacher ever born can make me do nothing. You ain't making me go nowhere, missus. You just remember that. You ain't making me go nowhere. And he waited until he was sure she was crying. And then he shuffled out of the building. I need to say I really empathize with Miss Caroline. The first day that you teach ever, it's a trial by fire. You know, I, I know mine was, and I could tell you stories, but we haven't got the time for it. But uh, 
it's nerve wracking. And uh, well, I will say this: the first time I taught a, a student teaching thing, I was so nervous. I talk so fast because I talk fast when I'm nervous that my 40-minute lesson plan was over in 15 minutes, <laughs> and the kids just looked at me, and, the, and one of them said, "What?" And I said, "What do you mean, what?" And someone said, and "Somebody said." Look, you don't have to worry about us, Mr. Leifert. We won't bite. You know, sit down. Take it easy. Take a breath. Sort of like her. Anyway. So yes, Miss O'Brien, thanks to her and other influential teachers and my brother Dennis, I've become a lifelong reader. Uh, and I do believe you are what you read, at least to some extent. Books have become such an integral part of my life uh, that I've become a passionate collector of things such as literary t-shirts and literary coffee mugs. I brought two in here. I'm going to use one of them in just a minute. Uh, well, actually, all along the side of this coffee mug, mug are quotes of the first lines of famous books, like, for instance, Call Me Ishmael. Uh, let's see. I don't know all of them. But anyway, the answers are all on the bottom. You can look oh. them up. Oh. It's fun. You know, it's like a little puzzle. I've also got one here that's like the last lines of each book, which I don't do so well at. But, but this one. I'm going to just tell you what's on some of those. You can look those over. After. Very much so. They are the Okies, whose homesteads and land were uh, ravaged by the Dust Bowl and then confiscated and repossessed by the banks. Now, in this particular scene, they've been traveling with the Wilsons, uh, good people, uh, who are sharing space in their car, and they, they help each other out. Uh, but at this point, the Wilson's car breaks down. Just a moment here. Uh, so the, it has just broken down. Now I'm going to start reading. And, this, and I love the Okies. <clears throat> the family piled down from the truck and clustered about the touring car. Pa asked, how bad? Tom looked up and said, well... We've got to tear the pan off and get the rod out, and we've got to get a new part and hone her and shimmer and fit her. Good day's job. We've got to go back to that last place for a part, Santa Rosa. Albuquerque is about 75 miles on... Oh, Jesus. Tomorrow's Sunday. We can't get nothing tomorrow. The family stood silently. Monday, we'll, we'll get the thing. Probably won't get her fitted before Tuesday, and we ain't got the tools to make it easy. It's going to be a job. Pa said, well, what I'm scared of is... We'll run out of money, and so we can't get there at all. Here's us all eating and got to buy gas and oil. If we run out of money, I don't know what we're going to do. I got an idea. There's an R on that, so I thought I'd emphasize that. Tom said, maybe nobody's going to like it, but here she is. The nearer to California our folks get, the quicker they're going to get jobs, and there's going to be money rolling in. Now, this here car will go twice as fast as our truck. Now, you take out some of that stuff in the truck, and then... All you folks but me and the preacher here can move on. Me and Casey will stop here and fix this car, and then we'll drive on day and night, and we'll catch up. The family gathered, to, the gathered family considered it. Pa said, well, I, I kind of got a notion Tom's right. It ain't going to do no good to all of us staying here. We can get 50, 100 miles on before dark. Ma said worriedly, worriedly how are you going to find us? Well, we'll be on the same road, said Tom, 66, right on through. Come to a place named Bakersfield, seen it on the map I got, you go straight on there. Yeah, but when we get to California and spread out sideways off this road, don't you worry, Tom, reassured her. We're going to find you. California ain't the whole world. Looks awful big on the map, she says. Pa said, well, if that's the way she's going to go, we better get shoving. We can maybe squeeze in 100 miles before we stop. Ma stepped in front of him. I ain't a gonna go. What you mean you ain't a gonna go? Pa was amazed. Pa was amazed at the re uh, revolt. You got to go. You got to look after the family. Ma stepped to the touring car and reached in on the floor of the back seat. She brought out a jack handle and balanced it in her hand easily. I ain't a gonna go. Well, I tell you. You got to go. We made up our mind. And now Ma's mouth set hard, and she said softly, only way you're going to get me to go is whoop me. She moved the jack handle gently again. 
and I'll shame you, Pa. I won't take no whooping, crying, and a begging. I'll lay it into you, and you ain't so sure you can whoop me anyway. And if you do get me, I swear to God, I'll wait till you got your, uh, got your back turned where you're sitting down, and I'll knock you belly up with a bucket. I swear to holy Jesus' sake, I will. Pa looked helplessly about the group. She's sassy, he said. I never seen her so sassy. Ruthie giggled, giggled shrilly. Thank you for whoever giggled back there. <laughs> the jack handle flicked hungrily back and forth in Ma's hand. Um, Come on, said Ma. You made up your mind. No, I'm sorry. Come on, Ma said. You made up your mind. Come on and whoop me. Just try it. But I ain't a-going. Or if I do, you ain't a-going to get no sleep. Because I'll wait and I'll wait and just the minute you take sleep in your eyes, I'll slap you upside the head with a stick of stove wood. So goddamn sassy, Pa murmured. And she ain't young either. The whole group watched the revolt. They watched Pa waiting for him to break into fury. They watched his lax hands to watch the fists form. And Pa's anger did not rise. <laughs> his hands hung limply at his sides. And in a moment, the group knew that Ma had won. And Ma knew it, too. Tom said, Ma, what's eating on you? What do you want to do this way for? What's the matter with you anyways? You gone John Rabbit on us? I don't know what John Rabbit means. Ma's face softened, but her eyes were still fierce. You done this without thinking much, Ma said. What we got left in the world? Nothing but us. Nothing but the folks. We come out, and Grandpa, he reached for the shovel shelf right off, which means they buried him on the side of the road. You know what I'm and, and now, <coughs> right off, you want to bust up the folks. Tom cried, Ma, are we going to catch up with you? We wasn't going to be long. Ma waved the jack handle. Excuse me. Suppose we was camped, and you went on by. Suppose we got on through. How'd we know where to leave the word? And how'd you know where to ask? We got a bitter road. Grandma's sick. She's up there on top of the truck, a pawing for the shovel herself. She's just tired out. We got a long, bitter road ahead. Uncle John said, but we could be making some money. We could, the money we'd make wouldn't do no good, she said. All we got is the family unbroke. Like a bunch of cows, when the lobos are ranging, they stick all together. I ain't scared while we're all here, all that's alive. But I ain't going to see us bust up. I'm going cat wild with this here piece of bar iron if my own folks busts up. Her tone was cold and final. Tom said soothingly, Ma, we can't all camp here. There's no water here and not even much shade. Grandma needs shade. All right, said Ma. We'll, we'll go along. We'll stop first place they water and shade. And a truck will come back and take you into town to get you apart and it'll bring you back. You ain't uh, going walking along uh, in the sun and I ain't having you out alone. So if you get picked up, there ain't nobody of your folks to help you. And by getting picked up, I have to mention that Tom Jode was, uh, uh, he had uh, violated parole by leaving the state so they could be after him. Tom spread his hands helplessly and let them flop against his side. Pa, he said, if you was to rush her on one side and me on the other, and then the rest of us pile on and, and grandma jump down on top, Maybe we can get Ma without more than two or three of us get killed with that there jack handle. But if you ain't willing to get your head smashed, I guess Ma's went and filled her flush. Jesus Christ, one person with their mind made up can shove folks, a lot of folks around. You and Ma put away that jack handle before you hurt somebody. Ma looked in astonishment at the bar of iron. Her hand trembled. She dropped her weapon on the ground. And Tom, with elaborate care, picked it up and put it back in the car. He said, Pa... You just got set back on your heels. <laughs> and this is the line I love, and I use it on Phyllis all the time. I, I stick my hands in my pocket and slow. Used to be the man made the decisions. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Okay. <clears throat> Enough of that one. Uh, let me see, see what time it is so I can see how I'm doing. 2.12. I started at what time? 1.30. Okay, good. My mind is a computer. Another book that I really love is The Rocket Boys. It's, an, a, it's a memoir. And 
Uh, it was made into a movie called October Sky, and probably some of you have seen that movie, and it's a wonderful movie. Everybody says it is, you know, and it is. Uh, it's about a boy who, uh, in 1957, when Sputnik first came over, and he was impressed by it, decided to learn to teach himself how to build rockets on his own from scratch so that he could get a job with NASA, and that's the way it all worked out for him. Uh, and it wasn't all that easy. Uh, now, the film is, is good and it's still popular, but the one thing that bothers me about the film, as it always bothers me about films, is not that they changed anything, but they left out billions of tons of wonderful things. That, but also the fact that they really gave short shrift to Sonny's mother, uh, the boy's mother, uh, Everybody remembers Laura Dern playing the teacher, you know, who was so good, and, and, and she was in, in real life and everything, but his mother was something else. And in the movie, they made her a Stepford wife, kind of. I mean, they'd give her an apron, and she criticized a few things, but she was pretty easy to get along with. Uh, in, in real life, according to the book, she is a freaking firebrand. <laughs> and, uh, oh, I was going to fix this, but I guess I'll do it this way. Okay, yeah, that works. So here's a scene where, um, I'm going to read two scenes because I guess i got time. Uh, Sonny is heading out to the school bus, and uh, he has forgotten his lunch bag, his uh, bag of lunch. And so Ma comes, his mom comes running out behind him in her uh, house coat, and pulled tight against the cold because it's winter, and she caught me in time to hand me my brown bag lunch. Late again, younger Hipp Hickam, that was his last name, Jake announced giving me the eye. And then he saw my mother and said, Morning, Elsie, how you do? Well, I'd do better if I could get Sonny moving in the morning, Jack. She smiled up at him. Ah, the boy will get some sense someday, Jack said. Swinging the door shut, Mom waved and carefully scooted uh, her house slippers up the walk. And I made my way up the aisle, wedging myself in three to a seat. As we trundled through town, I saw a few women out in their front yards shoveling coal into shuttles. This is back in cold days. It's, by the way, Coalwood is a town, and that's all they do is coal mines. Uh, they were carrying their shuttles uh, inside to their warm morning heaters. That's capital WM, warm morning. That was a brand, I guess. Most of the women were bare-legged, and peeking beneath the bottom of their woolen clothes, coats were pastel-colored nighties, which was the standard Christmas gift from miners to their wives during the good times. Mom liked to tell about the time uh, when she and Dad, just after they were married, and she ran out into the snow like that to the coal box with nothing but her Christmas nightie on and encountered a line of miners walking uh, their way to work on the other side of the fence. Naturally, they all stopped to comment. <laughs> now, Elsie, Homer will be buying you a coat soon, darling, Mr. O'Leary said sympathetically. He bain well better, Mr. Larson said, eyes popping. Ah, that Homer, Mr. Salvador said, putting his fingers to his lips. He's a very, very lucky boy. <laughs> Mom grabbed her shuttle and ran for the porch, only to slip, both feet flying over her head, her pink ruffled matching house uh, slippers sent sailing. At least the snow cushioned her landing. The miners started to climb right over the fence to help her, but she told them to stop and dared them to take one more step farther. She said she was fine. She didn't make a move because if she got up, they'd see a lot more of her than she wanted any man to see. So there she sat, melting on the ice beneath her until the miners left, only after asking her many more times than she felt was necessary if she was sure she was all right. And then she made another run for the door. She was so embarrassed she didn't venture outside for the rest of that day. And when Dad got home after work, he found the warm morning, meaning the stove, uh, it was cold. Why didn't you keep the fire burning? He demanded, raising up the heater door and peering in at the cold ashes on the grate. I work hard all day, and I expect to come home and see something burning in here. You want to see something burning? <laughs> I sure do. Okay. Mom went upstairs and came down with the Christmas nightie and the matching slippers, stuffed them all into the warm morning, and set them ablaze. Better? <laughs> a 
so that just gives you a little idea of her attitude, which is all the way through this book. I mean, it's like when her husband comes in and says, damn it, our son just blew up that fence. You know, he, okay, son, you're not going to do that anymore. I'm taking away all your stuff, blah, blah, blah. And he would leave. And then the mother would turn around and smile at him and say, so, going to let your father push you around like that all the time? <laughs> you know, just, um, oh, shoot, I lost the second part. <laughs> it's in here somewhere. Give me a sec. I might find it. Yeah, no. Ah, here it is. Here's another one. Um, now, the, the big conflict in the book is mother does not want her husband to bring up her wonderful son going into the mines. No, put her foot down. That's not going to happen. Father wanted it that way. He said, oh, he should be there. You know, this is what we all do. We live here. And so at one point in their lives, without her knowing it, he talked his son to follow him down into the mine to get a look and uh, said to him basically like, wouldn't you like to be a mining engineer? And he had to say to his father, truthfully, no, I'd, I'd like to be a rocket engineer. And that really ticked his father off. So they come up in the chute, up in the mining area, and unexpectedly, there's mom. <laughs> you know, so this is the way it goes. The lift jerked, and once more, we started up. I glumly watched the rocks slide past. I'd really messed up this time. Dad wasn't only mad at me, I knew I'd hurt him too. And um, I blamed myself for everything. I should never have agreed to go down in the mine. I knew what Dad was likely to be getting at, and I knew I wasn't going to agree to it. So why had I gone along with it? I was a stupid kid sometimes, no doubt about it. As we neared the surface, the cold, fresh air off the mountain blew down the shaft, giving me a shiver. The earth's surface slipped past, and there, standing at the gate, still in her church clothes, was my mother. A rock dust crew stood nearby, their eyes locked on her. She shouldn't be there. <laughs> yeah. uh, they shifted their gaze to Dad and me. Mom stared at what I knew must be my grimy face my coal mas mascaraed eyes, and my blackened coveralls. Then, to utter astonishment, she burst into tears. The rock dust crew took a step backward. Some of them took off their helmets, rubbing their heads and looking down at their feet as if embarrassed uh, to be witnesses to her tears. Dad tried to shuffle her. <laughs> shush her. <laughs> Dad tried to shush her. Stop it, Elsie. You're scaring the men, he said, while <laughs> unlatching the lift gate. Everything's fine, Mom, I said, my stomach bottoming out. We were about to have a family argument right here in front of God and everybody. I couldn't imagine anything more embarrassing. Well, he's, he's thinking about being a mining engineer, Dad said doggedly. Mom's tears dried up instantly, as if they'd been sucked back inside her. Over my dead body, a voice from deep inside her said. Dad pushed me ahead. Now go on. Get in there and take a shower, get yourself clean. Uh, and he looked at all the crew and said, this is none of your business. The rock dust crew moved off only a couple of feet so they could keep listening. I walked to the bathhouse, this is where all the men go in, but stopped at the door. Even though I was so mortified I wanted to disappear, I wanted to hear too. Mr. Dubonnet, wearing his miner's helmet with street clothes, stepped outside and saw what was happening, crossed his arms, leaned against the wall, chuckling. I didn't know what he thought was so blame funny. What the devil is wrong with you, Elsie? Dad hissed, reaching to take her arm. She pulled back. This mine has killed you, she said. But it's not going to kill my boys. You're talking nonsense. Am I? Black spot the size of a dime, remember, she said, poking her index finger right into his chest. Here, right on the right side, she poked him again hard. Dad huffed a near laugh, reached down for a handful of coal dust and tossed it in the air and took a deep breath of it. I thrive on this stuff. It's like mother's milk to me. Mom watched the dust settle around him. Some of it blew in her face, sticking to her makeup, but she didn't flinch. She turned and marched into the bathhouse where I had retreated, sending naked miners scrambling for towels. <laughs> she grabbed me by the arm. You can wash at home, she growled. As we came out, Mr. Dumonet tipped his helmet to her, but all he got in return was a dirty look. The rock dust crew scattered before her. Only Dad stood his ground, his helmet in his hand. He watched us pass without any comment. And all the way down from the path to the tipple, I could feel his eyes boring into me. Anyway, she, 
she could have been a boxer. <laughs> you know, I tell you, I'm just so proud of her. Um, okay, the last section I'm going to read is really crazy. Um, it is from, um, let's see, before I say anything, let me find it. Um, it is from The World According to Garp. I don't know if any of you have read it or seen the movie. Uh, and this one needs no introduction because it starts with, at the beginning. And uh, what you're going to do is meet Garp's mother, who is a nurse. Um, and not your average human being. Uh, I have to jump around a little bit, but you won't notice, I don't think. Garp's mother, Jenny Fields, was arrested in Boston in 1942 for wounding a man in the movie theater. That tells you something. Now we're going to jump away from that a bit in a minute, but then we'll get back to it. This was shortly after the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor, and people were being tolerant of soldiers because suddenly everyone was a soldier. But Jenny Fields was quite firm in her intolerance of the behavior of men in general and soldiers in particular. In the movie theater, she had to move three times, but each time this soldier moved closer and closer to her until she was sitting against the musty wall, her view of the newsreel almost blocked out by some silly colonnade or colonnade, and she resolved she would not get up and move again. The soldier once more uh, moved and sat beside her. This is where I go away for a minute. Jenny was 22. She had dropped out of college almost as soon as she'd begun. But she had finished her nursing school program at the head of her class, and she enjoyed being a nurse. In fact, she had dropped out of college when she suspected that the chief purpose of her parents sending her to Wellesley had been to have her dated and eventually become mated to some well-bred man. The recommendation of Wellesley had come from her older brothers who had assured her parents that Wellesley women were not thought of loosely and were considered high in marriage potential. Jenny felt that her education was merely a polite way to bide time, as if she were really a cow being prepared only for the insertion of the device for artificial insemination. Yeah. <clears throat> Jenny was not inclined toward humor. There was a popular joke among the nurses at Boston that time but it was not funny to Jenny Fields. The joke involved one of the other hospitals in Boston. The hospital Jenny worked in was Boston Mercy Hospital, which was called Boston Mercy. There was also Massachusetts General Hospital, which was called Mass General, and another hospital, which was Peter Bent Brigham Hospital, which was called the Peter Bent. One day, as the joke goes, a Boston cab driver had his taxi hailed by a man who staggered off the curb toward him, almost dropping to his knees in the street. The man was purple in the face with pain. He was either strangling or holding his breath so that talking was clearly difficult for him. And the cabbie opened the door and helped him inside where the man lay face down on the floor alongside the back seat, tucking his knees up to his chest. Hospital! Hospital, he cried. Uh, the, the Peter Bent, the cabbie asked. That was the closest hospital. Worse than that, the man moaned. I think Molly bit it off. <laughs> Sorry, that was bad taste. But you're, if you are like Jenny Fields, you'll understand because it says few jokes were funny to Jenny Fields and certainly not this one. Okay. Uh, now we're going to get into science and then we'll get back to the movie theater. Most Peter treatment that Jenny saw was done to soldiers. The U.S. Army would not begin to benefit from the discovery of penicillin until 1943, and there were many soldiers who didn't get penicillin until 1945. At Boston Mercy, in the early days of 1942, Peters were usually treated with sulfa and arsenic. Sulfathiazole was for the clap, with lots of water recommended. For syphilis, in the days before penicillin, they used <laughs> Neoarsfamine, yeah, whatever. They use something that's got arsenic in it. Anyway, 
Jenny Fields thought that this was the epitome of all that sex could lead to, to introduce arsenic into the human chemistry, to try to clean the chemistry up. The other Peter treatment was local and also required a lot of fluid. Jenny frequently assisted with this method of disinfecting because the patient required lots of attention at the time. Sometimes, in fact, he needed to be held down. It was a simple procedure that could force as much as 100 cc's of fluid up the peter and through the surprise urethra before it all came back. But the procedure left everyone feeling a bit raw. Everyone. The man who invented the device for this method of treatment was named Valentine, and his device was called the Valentine Irrigator. Long after Dr. Valentine's irrigator was improved or replaced with another irrigation device, the nurses at Boston Mercy still referred to the procedure as the Valentine treatment. An appropriate punishment for a lover, thought Jenny Fields. My mother, wrote Garp, was not romantically inclined. <clears throat> Back to the movie theater. When the soldier in the movie theater first started changing seats, when he made his first move for her, Jenny Fields felt that the Valentine treatment would be just the thing for him. But she didn't have an irrigator with her. It was much too large for her purse. It also required considerable cooperation of the patient. What she did have with her was her scalpel. And she carried it with her all the time. She had not stolen it from surgery either. It was a castaway scalpel uh, that had uh, a deep nick taken out of the point. It had probably been dropped on the floor or in a sink. It was no good for fine work. <clears throat> But it was not for fine work that she wanted it then. At first, the scalpel had slashed up the in little silk pockets of her purse. So then she found part of a thermometer container that slipped over the head of the scalpel, capping it like a fountain pen. It was this cap she removed when the soldier moved into the seat beside her and stretched his arm along the armrest in between them that they were absurdly meant to share. His long hand dangled off the end of the armrest. It twitched like the flank of a horse, shuddering the flies away. Jenny kept her hand on the scalpel inside her purse. <clears throat> With her other hand, she held the purse tightly in her white lap. She was imagining that her nurse's uniform shone like a holy white shield, and for some perverse reason, this vermin beside her had been attracted by the light of it. My mother, Garp wrote, went through her life on the lookout for, pur for purse snatchers and snatch snatchers. <laughs> In the theater, I said this was going to be young adults only, you know, and above. Okay. <clears throat> In the theater, it was not her purse that the soldier wanted. He touched her knee. Jenny spoke up clearly and loudly. Get your stinking hand off me, she said. Several people turned around to gawk. Oh, come on, the soldier moaned, and his hand shot quickly under her uniform. He found her thighs locked tightly together, but he also found something else. He found his whole arm, from his shoulder to his wrist, suddenly sliced open like a soft melon. Jenny had cut cleanly through his insignia and his shirt, cleanly through his skin and muscle, bearing his bones at the joint of his elbow. If I had wanted to kill him, she told the police later, I'd have slit his wrist. I'm a nurse. I know how people bleed. <laughs> the soldier screamed. On his feet and falling back, he swiped at Jenny's head with his uncut arm, boxing her ear so sharply that her head sang. She pawed at him with the scalpel, removing a piece of his upper lip, the approximate shape and thinness of which was, was the shape of a thumbnail. I was not trying to slit his throat, she insisted. I was trying to cut his nose off, but I missed. <laughs> Crying on all fours, the soldier groped his way to the theater aisle and headed toward the safety of the light in the lobby. Somebody else in the theater was whimpering in fright. Jenny wiped her scalpel on the movie seat, returned it to a purse, and covered the blade with a the thermometer cap. And then she went to the lobby 
where keen wailings could be heard. And the manager was calling through the lobby doors over the dark audience, is there a doctor here? Is there a doctor in the house? Somebody, a doctor, please. And someone was a nurse. <laughs> and she went to lend what assistance she could. <laughs> when the soldier saw her, he fainted. It really wasn't from loss of blood. Jenny knew how facial wounds bled. They were deceptive. The deeper gash on his arm was, of course, in need of immediate attention, but the soldier was not bleeding to death. No one but Jenny seemed to know that. There was so much blood, and so much of it was on her white nurse's uniform. They quickly realized she had done it. The theater lackeys would not let her touch the fainted soldier, and someone took her purse from her. The mad nurse, the crazed slasher. Jenny Fields was calm. She thought it was only a matter of waiting for the true authorities to comprehend the situation. But the police were not very nice to her either. Uh, you've been dating this guy long, said the first one en route to the precinct. And another one asked her, well, how did you know he was going to attack you? He says he was just trying to introduce himself. <laughs> That's a mean little weapon, honey, a third told her. You shouldn't carry something like that around with you. That's just asking for trouble. Anyway, jump to the end of this section. Finally, things were cleared up when the police discovered that the soldier was from New York where he had a wife and child. He had taken a leave in Boston, uh, and more than anything else, he feared the story would get back to his wife. Everyone seemed to agree that would be awful for everyone, so Jenny was released without charges. When she made a fuss that the police had not given her her scalpel back, one of her brothers said, for God's sakes, Jennifer, can't you steal another one? <laughs> now, this was the strong woman section that's come to an end. And therefore, I, I think I'm not the only one that has feared strong women in my life. Uh, I think it's a lot of men fear that, you know. So I put this last poem uh, in here that I just thought would be a good way to end up. It's just kind of funny. It's one of my favorite poets called Tony Hoagland, or named Hoga, Tony Hoagland, and it's called And the Men. And I think they've come around like I have, you see. And the men want back in. All the Dougs and the Michaels the Darnells and Eric's, the Jose's, they're standing by the off-ramp of the interstate, holding up cardboard signs that say, we'll work for relationships. <laughs> their love mobiles are rusty. Their shaggin' wagons are up on cinder blocks. They're reading self-help books and practicing abstinence. They're uh, taking out personal ads that say, good listener would like to meet lesbian ladies for purpose of friendship only. In short, they've changed their minds. The men, they want another shot at the collaborative enterprise, want to do 50-50 housework and childcare. They want commitment renewal weekends and couples therapy because being a man was finally too sad. In spite of the perks, the lifetime membership benefits, uh, it all got old, telling the joke about the hooker and the priest, at the company barbecue, praising the vintage of the beer and punching the shoulders of a bud in the little overflow of homeosocial bonhomie, always holding the fear inside like a tipsy glass of water. Now they're ready to talk, really talk about their feelings. In fact, they're ready to make you sick with the revelations of their vulnerability. A pool of testosterone is spreading from around their feet. It's draining out of them like radiator fluid, like history, like an experiment that failed. So here they come on their hands and knees, the men. Here they come. They're really beaten. No tricks this time, no fine print. Please, they're begging you. Look out. Thank you. Wow. You made it within the name. <laughs> the five-hour version would have had so much more, just like the, the books instead of the movies, but there you go. No, I thank you all for coming. It's really nice to see so many, you know. It's good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And if anybody would like to talk about anything, I'm here. Uh, whatever. Excuse me. Oh, my, my pups? Yes, my mugs. They might, you might like to check those out if you're... Oh, yeah. Uh, if um, you like trivia, you know, these these are kind of fun. I'd... Mother died today, or maybe yesterday. That's the first line or something. Uh, <coughs> and it says on the bottom, 
Yeah, the answers are on the bottom. You, you really need your glasses on to read those. But, and this is the one that has the ending lines of books. So it's been Where a pleasure. Where did you get that? Uh, online. In fact, I have a whole set of things like Kurt Vonnegut quotes, you know, and what book they came from, and various authors. <clears throat> I don't collect things anymore, but I would, I've gone through lots of phases where I was, you know, obsessive compulsive, and I would just buy all kinds of things, and I've had to get rid of most of this stuff because we moved into a small apartment. So. Yes? Is this your first installment? Are you going to tell us other? Well, I could, except that, you know, I'm not sure if I'm going to or not. Uh, you could pick it outside the library with signs and give me to come back. Because I do have those other ones I cut out over five hours. You know, but in fact, I think I'd like that, picketing. And unfair, unfair. So this is actually the seventh one you've done? Or yes, <laughs> yes. And I did say this is probably my last one, but I don't know. Well, we might be able to take this off. And she said maybe I'll, maybe I'll pull, <laughs> and she said maybe I'll pull a Tom Brady, you know, come back. Yeah, I know. That's a